there has been almost an epidemic of left brain in uh, communication. So we talk about creativity, the importance of emotional advertising, and I think uh, we need to go back to a different approach. I think the purpose provides you with a lot of kind of opportunities to do that because it's about emotional communication, but brands need to connect emotionally with consumers. I'm Carolyn Hadlock, Executive Creative Director at Young & Laramore, and this is The Beautiful Thinkers Project, a podcast where I ask founders, creators, leaders, and visionaries how they bring their ideas to life. As we enter these conversations with thinkers across disciplines like art, science, and business, we'll learn a little bit more about the practices and identifiers that create beautiful thinking, something defined so individually, but so universally recognizable. Welcome to The Beautiful Thinkers Project. Today, I'm talking to Alessandro Manfredi, who is the EVP of Dove at Unilever. He is one of the original architects of the Campaign for Real Beauty that launched in 2004, forever changing the way girls and women define beauty. I am thrilled to have you on the show, Ale. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Caroline. Well, I'd like to ask you about purpose as a place to start. And, you know, as we just said, in 2004, you were one of the original members on the team, really of one of the original brands that really put purpose at their core. And in fact, Dove is considered to be the largest provider of self-esteem education in the world today. In your mind, how has the concept of purpose changed for marketers since 2004? Well, uh, at the, at the very beginning, uh, there were not a lot of uh, brands and a lot of company having a purpose. It was really the projection of the values uh, of uh, of few people. Now it has, be- it has become, uh, uh, you, if you say it cynically, a little bit like a, a marketing tool. Uh, but at the same time, I think without being cynical, I think that what has happened, uh, and it's a good thing, is that consumer have changed and consumer really require uh, companies and brands uh, to go beyond the profit, to have a a social impact, uh, to have a positive social impact. And actually, you can uh, well combine uh, doing good and uh, doing good business. And I mean, we are are proving it now with uh, uh, Unilever, all the brands that really have a purpose at the heart of the business model growing twice as much as the other brands. So it shows that uh, consumers now really are awarding brands with a social mission. Yeah, I definitely have seen that as well. In fact, I just read your case study in that wonderful book, Brands on a Mission. And it does seem that that the the brands who are putting purpose at the heart, and you said in, in a non-cynical way, in a more authentic way, it's good business, which is really exciting to see. And since the beginning, you guys have had success. I mean, I was reading early on that you were having in the U.S., you you tripled your sales, you know, and so it's neat to see you guys leading the way on that. Okay, current campaign, Lizzo, what an amazing choice. I don't think you could have captured more dimensions of inclusion than than in your choice of her. I'd love just to hear you talk about the the path to the choice of Lizzo and, and what you're hoping to accomplish with the new campaign. Well, um, I think, you know, it was uh, our choice, but it's also her choice. I think, you know, we like to think really that uh, you find each other in a way when you when you share a common mission. I think the recent campaign, which is called Evolution Reloaded, is part of a broader campaign that we call uh, Let's Change Beauty. And it's basically a bit the epitome of uh, our attempt to change the world of beauty. We want beauty to be fun. We want beauty to be a pleasure, a a source of uh, uh, happiness, not a source of anxiety. And there are too many things in beauty that are still not there. And that's why many women and many girls don't don't feel comfortable to define themselves as uh, as beautiful. In this specific campaign, actually, what we have realized is that uh, we're talking about digital retouching, especially. We have realized that uh, after having done a a film that was very famous called Evolution 15 years ago, uh, where we were actually talking about uh, the dangers of uh, digital distortion in advertising, in mass media, we realized that now those dangers are actually in the hands of every single girl. Actually, we did a study. Uh, referring to that, and uh, by the age of 13, 80% of girls have already used a digital digital app to distort themselves. And uh, 
When you try to be somebody you are not, it has a negative impact on your self-esteem. And if you think about all what's happening with uh, all the lockdowns around the world, uh, the usage of social media and the consequent pressure has become bigger and bigger. So we have created a tool because we don't do a campaign without having done something about it. Uh, we have created a tool called the Selfie Talk, which is a, a clinically proven, in a way, tool uh, that helps mothers or carers uh, to have, and parents in general, to have conversation with the girls and make them more resilient to navigate the world of social media. So in that context, we teamed up with Lizo because, of course, she's a big expert of uh, uh, what's happening in the social media about, and, and, and about the body confidence. And actually, she can be a fantastic role model for our young girls. I noticed it was interesting. You didn't do a major... TV ad campaign talking about this. You you took a little bit more of an editorial approach and had her announce it. And it seems like that has been a pattern even since the beginning with doing these sort of smaller films. Um, talk about that a little bit in your approach. Yeah, I think that the, the most important thing is that more and more uh, as part of our campaign, we team up with uh, whether you have people like Lizzo, but also influencers maybe that are, maybe have not the same size of reach, because we believe it's really important that people hear uh, not only from DAV, uh, but hear from our partners, uh, not only because they have uh, greater credibility, but because we genuinely believe that we cannot uh, change beauty alone. Uh, that's a little bit the realization, if you ask me, from 15 years ago, where it was just the brand talking. And of course, we had some partners, but more like experts. Uh, uh, now we are realizing that if we want to change beauty, it needs a systemic change. And that's why we started first by engaging a celebrity, for example, like Lizzo, but also former influencers uh, into helping us change beauty, helping us spread uh, the message. And that's, that's the, not just, uh, let's say, a change of marketing, uh, but it's also a philosophy of uh, opening up the brand to more voices uh, uh, rather than being just the only ones, because we realize, as I say, that alone we can't change it all. Yeah, well, and I was going to ask about the uh, the partnership you've shared with Ogilvy since since the beginning. Are there still some original members on that team as well from the beginning? Um, I would say less and less, but there are still uh, yeah, there are still people that uh, are part of the broader uh, team that have been part of the campaign. But we have also like a community of people that moved on uh, that still kind of cheer up when we do a campaign and uh, and write to me. Well, and and in marketing, when you look at brands who choose multiple agencies multiple times. What do you think has been the benefit of sort of staying the course with the same agency over the past, you know, since 2004? Well, the, the benefit is the uh, deep understanding of the brand and consistency in, uh, in the quality of the teams that worked uh, on that. So Ogilvy has always been very attentive at uh, managing the equity and managing it like a, a true global brand, mm -hmm. but still making it local, keeping it locally. Uh, locally relevant. I'd love to go back to the beginning. I know there was a, there's obviously your work is very research based and you have a lot of insights that come from that research. And I know in the beginning, before you launched the campaign, there was a story that I read about having to sort of persuade the executives at Unilever to, to embrace the insight. Would you mind sharing that story? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it was a time where uh, we were close to get, yes, an agreement to launch the campaign. And we had to speak to a committee of executives, of, of senior executives of Unilever. And we wanted to get the green light for that. And uh, we felt that, uh, of course, we had uh, in our PowerPoint all the ammunitions to get this agreed. Uh, even if, of course, you can imagine at the time, there were always opinions of people saying, uh, you know, in order to sell in beauty, you need to show, show perfection, you need to show models. Um, so, of course, it was still like not always very easy to get uh, an agreement, especially from very left-brained uh, people. But that, that, that's why we said, you know, why don't we also try a different approach beyond the PowerPoint with the facts? We managed to um, get in touch with the daughters of some of them 
And uh, somebody from the agency asks a few questions about, uh, do you find yourself beautiful? What you like, what you don't like about your body? And then we put some of those facts, some of those declarations uh, into a very emotional video, uh, an internal video that really made everybody cry <laughs> in the room. But I, it was it was so obvious. And actually, it was a, a revealing also for many of us in the team that were already passionate about it, that we really we needed to do something about it. And, and of course, you know, everybody was quite surprised by little girls of eight years old telling, telling you, I have a flat stomach, I would like a flat stomach, and they were already flat in the stomach. And I think interestingly talking about this anecdote, because at the time we were only advocating to make a campaign based on real beauty. Uh, so widening the definition of beauty, showing more diversity in beauty, which today looks like old fashioned, but at the time was groundbreaking. We didn't talk about the self-esteem program, but I was actually probably in that moment that we realized, oh my God, the issue is bigger and it's bigger at lower ages. And that's why, you know, after a few months, we had started the campaign. We say, now we need to really talk, walk the talk. We need to do something about this. And we created the self-esteem program. Oh, that's interesting. That kind of just crystallized the need for that. Yeah. I, I remember when I first saw the the ad, and I know you've talked um, in the past about brand say versus brand do, and I was so impressed by the pairing, like the companion piece of both the powerful film of evolution, but then also the creation of the self-esteem fund. And one of the themes that I talk to people, especially people who are managing large global brands, is the need for brands to kind of step up and take that kind of role in society and the lengths that you all had to go to to have distribution and adoption and even um, affect legislation. You know, you've, you've definitely have taken on a, a role outside of a marketer and, um, and shaping kind of public policy. What is your favorite example of brand do that you have done since 2004? Yeah, probably the most favorite is uh, uh, is the Crown Act that we we did uh, recently. Of course, uh, the self esteem program is the one that has the biggest impact. You say we are the biggest provider in the world, and so it's something that is really long term and, and and substantial. But I think that uh, the Crown Act tells a lot of other things about how we are evolving our purpose. So the Crown Act, uh, for the people who don't know what it is, is uh, a legislation. Uh, a proposal of legislation that has already passed uh, in quite a number of states in the US uh, that makes uh, hair discrimination illegal. There are people that because they wear natural hair and their braids, for example, in schools or at work that in the US can be fired today or sent home, which is like uh, something really terrible, like quite shocking when we when we realize. And so what we did uh, was uh, together with many other NGOs, we really co-founded what we call the Crown Coalition to create uh, a greater respectful world for people with natural hair. And uh, uh, we managed already to pass the law in simply different states in the US. And now we are going for more and we're not going to stop there until it is totally illegal around the US. Of course, I, uh, why I am particularly passionate about this because actually uh, amongst all the injustices that we try to fight, this is one of the biggest, if not the biggest. There are people in our team that look at uh, the problem of body confidence, uh, less from a, in a way, like a business innovation point of view, but more like if they were an NGO. And if you are an NGO and look at body confidence, you think about it and you say, probably I should treat it like a disease because actually it's been declared as a, as a disease. And when you look at diseases, we have, we have learned from uh, uh, the social health model of fighting diseases. You cannot just go and do an individual intervention. You need to really intervene on the ecosystem. So the individual intervention is all what we have been doing with uh, individual educational programs. Uh, but all the ecosystem is, uh, I would say, toxic to, to say something, a strong word. Uh, then I think we're going we're gonna to create a bit of resilience for these girls, but it was not going to last for long if the rest... Uh, uh, of the world is toxic. And so there are things that, that are toxic around uh, this situation. Legislative situation is clearly something toxic. But if you also think about, uh, again, the pressure that there is uh, in social media and uh, the retouching 
or for example the the lack of uh, diversity that you see still in in advertising so we felt we we needed to look at that and say you know what are the things that make the world of beauty less toxic or let's say less, more toxic or less enjoyable uh, and how do we intervene and and that's why now we are moving very much from individual interventions only to systemic change and try to make, to make the changes one by one with the help of others because like, as i said before alone uh, we cannot do it all i love that i think that's so so powerful and and i you're not the first um marketer that I've talked to that has talked about NGOs, but I mean, five years ago, that never would have been part of a brand conversation, you know, working with the, at the NGO level. But I do think the private sector is, is having to step up and, and sort of facilitate these conversations. When you first launched the campaign in 2004, did you ever think it was going to last this long? I mean, it's evolved, but it's still true to its roots. We thought it would last uh, uh, simply because when you decide uh, you're not going to retouch women or um, you only use real women uh, at a certain point, you need to stick to it for for long term. So we thought it would last. We didn't think it would evolve that much. And I think we had to evolve because the the world evolves, but also because, to be extremely honest, uh, more and more companies, more and more brands talk about women empowerment, talk about uh, real beauty which in a way, of course, makes your life a little bit harder from a competition point of view. But it's, it's also a great thing because it, it makes the, the world of beauty uh, a better place to be. And so I would have not thought that actually so many brands and companies would go into this territory mm. so that we had to continue to evolve ourselves. But I would say it makes the thing more interesting. And as I said, at the end, it's good. It's good because it makes uh, the world less toxic, let's say. Yeah. And I know in the beginning of COVID, you all were trying to figure out how do you talk about real beauty in this the global pandemic and make it meaningful? And, and you came out with that beautiful campaign of um, courage. And I'd love just to hear you talk about how that pivot happened. To be honest, the first thing actually is the, at a certain point we were looking at during the pandemic uh, and the first lockdown uh, about uh, all our communication and we felt that 90% of it was completely irrelevant or completely out of touch. Um, so that was like the first like shit moment, to be <laughs> honest. And then honestly, we, we, we said, okay, what we need to do is uh, certainly to pivot responsibly to get people to actually wash their hands with any soap, not only with Dove. And so we did a, a campaign about uh, care to wash, Um, And it was really about educating people about washing their hands because that was the most important uh, and responsible way to shift our investment. And then what happened simply was uh, we saw some pictures uh, uh, actually from a photographer actually in Italy that was uh, uh, taking pictures of people coming out of hours and hours of shifts uh, in the hospital. And uh, and we said, but this is a... this is beauty today. Uh, uh, this is unfortunately, but this is beauty today, and and it's beautiful what these people are doing. And so we said, why don't we do something about it? But we said, it cannot be just an ad. Yeah, it would be inappropriate. I think we we wanted actually to leverage this to thank people that have that were really making all those efforts, risking their life. So we said, let's figure out what we can do in terms of donations. Let's figure out what we can do in terms of brand do. And uh, if and when we can do that, uh, then we run the campaign. Actually, we took very little in developing the campaign, but actually a little bit more in developing all the logistics about the donations. Uh, so at the end, we are very proud proud of it. Uh, and of course, it was a little bit of a shift versus our usual narrative, but that was uh, an exceptional moment. And we had something similar, actually, when we were right after Courage is Beautiful because we had all the Black Lives Matter Mm. event. And that was another moment where we said anything we say today is out of touch. First, we need to show our empathy towards what's happening and do something about it. And actually, we renewed our commitment in that moment to the Crown Coalition and to fighting systemic racism. That's another contest where you were not expecting, honestly, uh, in your plans, uh, something happening. But when you have... uh, the purpose, you know what you stand for, and it's easier to pivot. Yeah, I, I thought that was a really extraordinary um, shifting of gears. Did you guys ever have any backlash on any of your campaigns that you had to defend? 
not backlash that we had to defend. If anything, uh, uh, campaigns where the tonality was not maybe completely understood, so we had to, in a way, apologize. Uh, and then another one that was a uh, was a one where we were accused of having have a, a racist ad. And I think in that case, uh, um, I have to say, despite this being uh, completely unintentional, and it happens when you create uh, 650 GIFs uh, out of a campaign, you have one that is like uh, inappropriate, but still it teaches you a lot. Uh, first, uh, that of course, you need to apologize. But second, I think you need to first uh, take a better control of what goes out uh, because it if, if things that are not appropriate, you know, you need to improve your systems of uh, control. But at the same time, actually, the positive effect it had, even if it was un- unintentional, I think, is that we we really started to listen much more, um, in this case, to the Black uh, influencers uh, and to the people that love the brand. And, uh, and we learned a lot uh, about uh, how we could be better, how we could make a better difference to them. And that's how, in a way, Crown Coalition, you know, was born. So... At the end of the day, you always do mistakes. Uh, uh, it's important you do it unintentionally. It's important, of course, that you apologize, but then you move on and you you keep doing better. And, and I think if it helps you listen and improve, it's, it's okay. Yeah, I agree. I think there's also a nice moment in time where people are realizing and expecting brands to be more human. And if that's the case, then there's there's those kinds of things that are going to happen. But I think the brands that do take it as an opportunity to expand the conversation and and sort of be vulnerable in that way are the ones that have the staying power. On the activations, the brand activations you all have done, um, especially, you know, sketches is maybe the most famous one. What, what do you think the value is of doing those types of brand activations? I think what they do, what we have learned is that they make the brand uh, salient and uh, of course uh, even if viral doesn't exist anymore but they give you a return of investment in memorability and memory structure which is uh, much much really bigger than anything about your product that decays after after a few days so there is an element of efficiency but in general then an element of uh, differentiation and, uh, and meaningfulness of the brand that they build and we see that they build it in the long term in a much stronger way than uh, than product campaigns. I personally convince actually that even in the short term, they work as well as product campaigns. Um, but also what I've learned as well is that there is not a black and white, you know, solution. I don't think we could survive uh, commercially as a brand only doing purpose campaign. I think you need to balance the two. I think there were a few years, uh, in fact, uh, I would say five, five, six years after the campaign for the beauty where, uh, Probably in some product categories, we uh, exaggerated a bit in the balance of doing only purpose and very little functional information. And then uh, we saw the sales uh, going down because people choose brands, of course, based on their values. But also when they are in front of the shelf, uh, they look at, is this product better than the others? Uh, they, they think about the benefit they give. So you really were all, always need to keep a balance between, am I still being perceived superior as a product? And at the same time, of course, uh, the value that you project in terms of the brand. Did you and, you know, you've obviously stayed at the same place for a long time. So I'm curious to hear you talk about what you think the benefit of that has been for you. On staying on the same brand. And staying at the same company for a long time. Yeah. Look, uh, staying the same company, I I don't know if it's been a benefit, but definitely, you know, when uh, I am quite value driven and the company shares my value. So until there is a as a match of interest, uh, it plays a very important role for me. Uh, sometimes you learn by moving from a company to another, but sometimes the value that you have uh, into working with uh, a company that shares your exact values, especially on purpose, uh, is absolutely critical. There is a benefit of staying long on a brand because you you really feel it, uh, you really understand it, uh, and, uh, and I can see it in uh, those teams uh, within my brands that have people that have been for long on the brand. I think brands uh, need deep knowledge and deep understanding in order to be nurtured. I think there are so many cases out there of brands that have been changed and relaunched every three, four years and and lost their mojo. Well, and I would say even among your colleagues and your, your peers at other brands, 
you must be a little bit of an, of an outlier because a lot of, I think the average CMO now is changing jobs every three years. I mean, the cycle is, is so short, but I mean, the conversation for purpose has been so, has been given so much momentum um, with the pandemic. As you talk to sort of your peers at other brands, what, what are the kinds of things that they're worried about? What, what are the conversations you're having at your level across industry? First of all, in, internally, the uh, most important conversation is how do we bring purpose across every single brand? Because we know it drives growth. That's probably the biggest conversation that we have internally about how do we bring it across all brands. And I think the second conversation for me, which I also have seen a little bit in the industry, is that uh, there has been almost an epi- epidemic of left brain uh, in uh, communication. So we talk about, we call, can talk about creativity, the importance of emotional advertising or purpose. It's the same, still the same discussion, but I think you see a lot of literature talking about, uh, I think IPA has done some interesting studies about the prevalence of left brain advertising versus right brain. And I think uh, we need to go back to um, to a different approach. I think the purpose provides you with a lot of kind of opportunities to do that because it's about emotional communication. But brands need to connect emotionally with consumers. And uh, probably I think in the profession of marketeers, I think we need to get more balance uh, on, the, on the right side of the brain, whether it's, uh, it, I, sometimes it's a culture, it's a mindset, but it can be also about the people that do marketing that are, sometimes are seen more like uh, mini, mini general managers, uh, whilst uh, um, I think managing a brand is not about just being a, a general manager, it's about moving emotions, driving the values of the brand. Well, I, I could not agree more. I do think there's a lot, and, and a lot of that is just this, the glut of data, so much data, and people are, you know, they're, they're taking it literally, and they're, they're being guided by data, and when they do that, they miss the emotional piece of it. I, I think that, you know, data, uh, uh, quantitative testing, uh, all these things are good uh, for me at the very beginning to give you the rigor of what you really want to do on the brand. Actually, we need more rigor on, on the way you define the jobs to be done, what you want to really communicate in being sharp about the objective of a brief. But after you get that, uh, it's all about the soft side. Uh, it's all about qualitative research uh, and, and getting under the skin of consumer, generating insights. I think we have lost actually the, the value of how important it is an insight in a communication brief. Uh, uh, we put facts in communication briefs rather than insight. And if you have a great insight, you are 90% already close to the creativity that you need to have. And I think that's uh, um, something where we all in general have become lazy uh, because generating insight from a fact, it's difficult, requires hard work, requires qualitative research, consumer intimacy. And that data cannot give you. You really need to talk to consumers. You need to be curious. Yeah, I, I agree. The The qualitative piece has gotten lost. Um, and I was listening to um, something the other day, and it was talking about how the world is shifting from shareholder to stakeholder, which I thought was a really interesting concept for, for people. And it kind of brings our conversation full circle for when we started in the value of influencers and people who are in the conversation. But is that something you're hearing about too? This, you know, it's not enough just to to appeal to the shareholder, but now you have the stakeholders who are part of the larger equation? Yes, yes. I think it's a, the multi-stakeholder model that uh, for us in the is, is very important. But I think it's simply to say that uh, if you don't make more people happy, if you don't make the citizens, the people, the consumers uh, happy, you're not going to be rewarded. And also then the shareholder won't be rewarded. So it's about uh, trying to combine the two in a virtual circle. And, and uh, if you do something good, to society and uh, you make people understand what you're doing, then you're going to be rewarded. And if you are rewarded, you're going to do more of it. And then it's going to create a virtual circle. I think even as you spoke to, I was I was reading as well that the Unilever portfolio, they are now seeing Dove has sort of led the way for understanding how important purpose is, even to the bottom line, to the in and to the greater cause. And so I think it's uh, you should be really proud that 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 initiative is being spread across the other the other brands and the brand portfolio at Unilever because I'm I'm certain you could not have seen that back at, back in 2004 that impact and that ripple effect. Thank you Caroline. 
All right. Well, I think my last question, Ale, and I ask everybody that I interview because this is about beautiful thinking, is how would you define beautiful thinking? It's a, it's a difficult one, but I think what I would say also based on uh, how I see marketing is uh, is doing good. It's moving people arts because I think there is something artistic uh, and fun about uh, being in advertising and in communication. And I'm a frustrated artist in the sense that I was told I was never been an artist since I was nine. So I like to move arts maybe through the work of agencies, actually, through other ways. But I think it's about moving arts, but also doing good by doing good. Life is too short than just to do the, to win an award uh, for creativity. I think you really want to do it for a purpose. So um, doing good. I have to ask you now, tell me the story about since age nine and the frustrated artist. No, I remember something that, that touched me a little bit is that uh, uh, because I was I, pro- I was always the last one in primary school in drawings, and I was always told that you know you never you never you don't have any artistic ability. So I would have loved to do design architecture afterwards, but that stayed on me. Uh, but probably it was true. I didn't have <laughs> I didn't have those abilities. It was not the person being nasty. But then I said, okay, you know, but I still can move people's hearts in another way. And uh, this way of doing uh, communication, marketing, building brands is, uh, is another way. Well, it's a great way. And it's funny you say that because I, I meet so many people who think that creativity is only the ability to draw. And it's just such a small definition of it. So that's a conversation for another day. But that is something that I'm hoping with this project to really sort of unlock that creativity is much bigger than that. But well, I thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. And I I obviously love the work you're doing. And I thank you for sharing all the stories behind the work with me. Thank you very much, Caroline. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you found something that inspires you to think strange, different, new and beautiful thoughts. This podcast was created and produced by Young and Laramore an independent agency focused on helping national consumer brands take a stand. To explore more about today's conversation and all of the other thinkers I've spoken to, check out our blog, The Beautiful Thinkers Project, or follow us on Instagram at The Beautiful Thinkers.